I'm so glad to see everyone enjoying. Your blood glucose levels are rising. Um, and I'm so happy that you all could make it here tonight in our lovely Michigan weather, which can change in a moment, as we all know. But it's so nice to see so many smiling faces and a chance that you have in an evening to have a, an enjoyable evening, a camaraderie, a collegiality, and uh, even learn something along the way. And that's always a lot of fun. Um, you know, I was talking to um, one of our team at the office the other day, and I've known Andy for, as a friend of ours, I have known him for probably around 15 years as they used to have land parties at our home. And if you, anyone knows what a local area network party is, where you get 20, 14-year-old, 15-year-old boys together, sleep over, and they hook all their computers together, and then they play video games all night, and you buy pizza, and you know where your kids are overnight. So it works. But uh, Andrew has joined our team as our IT person. And uh, his girlfriend's name is Alexa. And we were talking the other day. And um, I was talking to her, and I said, Alexa, you know, that's a nice name, but where does it come from? You know, like your parents named you. And she said, actually, my parents were having trouble having me. And so I'm named after the doctor who helped them to have me. And he's not here tonight, but he is awesome, Alex Maximovich. <laughs> you know? And so we need to pass on the karma to Alex if he were here. Because in a moment, it caused me, reminded me to reflect on why we're here and the impact we have. And even though we're hard at work every day and toiling away and some days are better than others and other times you feel someone's putting toothpicks in your eyes, <laughs> when these moments come, you say, wow, we're really making a difference. And each and every one of you do. And my hat's off to Alex. And uh, please, for his team, uh, pass that on back. Um, awesome careers he's having and uh, making an impact on, on people's lives in such a wonderful way. And I just wanted to share that. It just came up this week, and I thought that was just awesome. And us meeting together in this way is an exchange of ideas. And I guess the vision we all share is that rising tides raise all boats. And there are so many thought leaders within our team that help us out in the community. And then every once in a while, we run into somebody who can make that tide rise even more or make us think differently or challenge settled ideas of what we do and why we do it. And I think that's really the purpose of our group. And then sometimes when things happen on the political level, um, where the legislature in Michigan would like us to account for every egg <laughs> or every embryo, even if it's uh, triploid, just in case they want to know more information later, then we can have as a collaborative group uh, speak our voice to say maybe that doesn't make sense and hope someone in Lansing listens. So to be able to communicate with e as, a, as a team, we do have a powerful voice in our community and in our state and even in the United States. It's a country and internationally. So I'm really glad you could all make it tonight and uh, um, even though it may get warm in here and if we have to open the doors up a little bit, uh, I'm really <coughs> glad you all could make it. Well, I'm really pleased tonight um, in introducing our speaker, Dr. Reindoller, um, to share just a little bit of background. But he's going to challenge us in how we think about things. And I think that's a good thing. But he's the executive director, as of the first of this year, of the uh, American Society for Re Reproductive Medicine. And he's the former chair of the part of OBGYN at Dartmouth Hitchcock Medical Center. And uh, the guys to School of Medicine at Dartmouth. And uh, prior to moving to Dartmouth in 05, he served on the fac in a faculty position at Harvard from 1997 to 2006, and at Tufts from 87 to 96, and back to the Medical College of Georgia from the very early 80s to the mid 80s. We won't go further <laughs> than that at this time. And he's not just board certified in OBGYN or reproductive endocrinology, but also in clinical genetics. And boy, is genetics making a surge in how we do what we do and how we think on all aspects of, of medicine. That's really the basis of translational study. 
he certainly has been an active leader professionally in organizations. He's a charter member of the North American Society of Pediatric and Adolescent Gynecology, and he's past president of that organization, and certainly involved uh, actively in the AMA and uh, American Gynecologic and Obstetrical Society, a Society for uh, Gynecologic Investigation, SGI, and the American Society of uh, Human Genetics. Um, he served in so many capacities in ASRM. I don't want to curtail his talk by listing all of those as he continues to. Um, and he's been such a great contributor within our field, um, academically, publishing, um, peer review, wonderful ideas and thoughts, sharing uh, with our community in all sorts of reproductive disorders, backgrounds in genetics, and really carrying uh, a wonderful practice over the years with uh, many types of uh, dis, uh, genetic disorders. I know if you keep in touch with what's going on at ASRM, there's a, a, uh, a special online conference coming up on Turner Syndrome and management issues in, in care in that way that he'll be leading. Um, more recently, um, well, more recently in the last five years, um, looking at more of the clinical aspects of what we do and why we do it, which he'll discuss more tonight. And we're always trying to find new acronyms and uh, you have not held back with the FAST-T and the 4-T trials. And even this month, um, sort of a secondary uh, dive into the data in this uh, month's Journal of uh, Fertility and Sterility, looking at this data and uh, asking a few different questions for second-tier outcomes, uh, which he's going to share with us tonight. But I'm really happy and thrilled to be able to introduce you to our guest speaker tonight, Dr. Richard Reindahler. Richard. Thank you, Michael, very, very much uh, for that great, very kind introduction and, and for this invitation here. When you talk about your children being at home at the LAN parties, it sends shivers down my back because the last party we had was an after prom party. And um, I might be able to talk about it in a couple more years. <laughs> um, um, so, but anyway, thank you so much for uh, having me join you this evening. Um, Michael asked if I might <coughs> share data from two large uh, infertility trials that I had the opportunity to, to be the principal investigator of when, when uh, at the Beth Israel uh, and Boston IVF in, in Boston. And they are the FAST trial and the 40 trials and, and I'd like to uh, put them into uh, really th the, their place uh, within uh, contemporary infertility care today. Um, I have no disclosures, and I'd also like to disclose that although I'm the executive director of ASRM, this represents my opinion. Uh, we hope that within the next year, we're waiting for the Reproductive Medicine Network Amigos trial paper to be published, and then we will have uh, a guideline on uh, unexplained infertility. Uh, but this is my uh, interpretation of the literature uh, that, that uh, having done a systematic review of unexplained infertility and, and placing into that context uh, these two trials. So we're going to look at um, the rationale for a fast uh, track approach for couples with unexplained infertility. Uh, the female partner under and over the age of 40 years of age, um, provide information about outcomes from expectant management, and discuss advantages and limitations for initiating treatment with clomiphene IUI in younger women. So this is the, the case that we all have. Uh, maybe they don't come twice, but they do from time to time. Couple presents a female partner at age 36 years, um, and then in this situation again at 40 with secondary infertility. Both times they're diagnosed with unexplained infertility, and at each time they ask what approaches are available and was it, what is the evidence to support the use of these uh, approaches. Um, when we think about factors for consideration when we, uh, in, in the management of couples with unexplained infertility, I mean the first thing is what is the chance for pregnancy without and with a specific treatment? You know, there are, there are treatments that we have that haven't been well studied, so the first thing we want to know is is, is the success rate consistently above that for no sick, if you had no treatment at all? Uh, certainly the, the goal would be that we would have an RCT in, in for every treatment that we do, and, and sometimes that's just not possible. Uh, what is the access to treatment for couples? The treatment's certainly not helpful. 
uh, if they can't, if we can't access it. And we know today that nearly two-thirds or more of our couples that come for infertility care cannot afford all of the care that is available to them. And one of the things in the strategic plan that the ASRM has this year that I'm really excited about is a campaign uh, to improve access to care and to look at all of the ways that we may do that. Um, what are the adverse outcomes? My wife and I have friends who have triplets from IVF. All three have really bad cerebral palsy. We don't want that to happen. And, and, and certainly, when couples ask me to put in more embryos than I would put in, I always refer back to them and say, I'm not never knowingly going to uh, be in the place of, of making this happen. And we, need, we know that there is the need for s uh, an ability for some couples to have any treatment available to them. They can afford IVF, they want IVF. But then there are other couples, and I'll show you an kind of an interesting example of that, of couples who want to do less invasive treatments and don't want in, in vitro fertilization, for example, if, that, if that's a treatment that would be available for them. Now this is a study, uh, a, a well-known study um, of Zinnemann and colleagues, and there are several other studies like this, where they took 200 couples who were beginning pregnancy at the start of their study, and they followed them monthly for one year to see how many of them would get pregnant on a month-to-month -month basis. These are couples, uh, of course, who haven't been determined to have um, infertility. And as we know, um, that, that in the first two months of treatment, about 30% of the couples trying will become pregnant. And as I tell my patients, and I'm sure you do too, the best that nature can do is 30% per cycle. It drops pretty rapidly after that, so that by six months, you know, we're in that five to 10% per cycle chance for pregnancy. And once you get out to 10, 11, and 12 months, you're looking at no better than 5% per cycle. And, in, in, and certainly after 12 months, you're in that 4% per cycle chance for pregnancy. So anything we do seemingly should be better than that. And we, we, we would pick a number, but, but we wanna know, is the treatment better than that? In, in Europe, much, much of the time, they, they make couples go for three years uh, because they have a chance for pregnancy, uh, but on the other hand, it's 4% per cycle. And other studies have shown the same, and I'll show you that control groups uh, of studies are the same thing, about 4% per cycle. Now, what is, you know, and we all know this, our couples come to us and they say, if it's not broken, how are you gonna fix it? You know, if I have unexplained infertility, how could anything treat it? And I always tell them it's upping the ante. We know that uh, with expectant management, if you have the best sperm count in the world, you, you get about 200 maximum sperm at the site of fertilization, not better than that. And in most cycles, 98% of cycles, they're monofollicular. So the goal would be for unexplained infertility, of course, that we do all the time, would be up, upping the ante, increasing the odds of, uh, over the 200 sperm or one egg ovulated. We could do that by adding more sperm along, IUI, and getting 10, 20, 30 million sperm there. We could do it with controlled ovarian stimulation uh, alone, either clomiphene alone um, or uh, gonadotropins alone uh, to get more eggs, since we believe that a lot of infertility is aneuploidy of the oocytes, increase the chance that one of those eggs is chromosomally normal. We could combine IUI with more sperm and COS and get more eggs. Or of course we could do IVF where we, we feel that we have a better chance of having a euploid embryo. And I'm not gonna, I have a talk on unexplained infertility and go through each of these after a systematic review, but the literature does not support these things. Expectant management, uh, certainly it's 4% it's per cycle. It doesn't ex it routinely support IUI alone. We know that there is sexual dysfunction and other reasons why it might be certainly um, uh, a reasonable treatment. Uh, while we potentially all have and may give uh, a few cycles of clomiphene in ovulatory women who can't afford anything else, the literature doesn't support it, although there are problems with the studies, the, uh, particularly a study from Scotland, Bhattacharya study, that I wish we had a better RCT to show that. And I'll show you that from an NIH Reproductive Medicine Network trial, uh, certainly gonadotropins alone was barely better than that 4% per cycle. So these things don't work. Now we know worldwide there are certainly many thousands of studies that have looked at different paradigms for couples with unexplained infertility. 
And they usually begin, in Europe, they begin with expectant management, but they move in a stepwise fashion to more costly and uh, more invasive um, uh, strategies. And in Massachusetts, where I was for 20 some years, um, we had to start with clomiphene IUI for unexplained infertility, and then if not pregnant, move on to gonadotropin IUI, and if not pregnant, move on to in vitro fertilization. And certainly that uh, changed with time. But the question is, are any of these strategies worthwhile, or should we go immediately to in vitro fertilization? Um, it certainly is the most successful thing we do, and it's certainly consistently uh, the most successful thing we do. So is there evidence for clomiphene IUI? Is there evidence for gonadotropin IUI? Um, and, and then IVF, of course, is, is the ultimate <coughs> therapy. This is a study that David Guzik did, uh, compiled the literature in 1998, and this is right as we were beginning to think about our first trial, the NIH study, the FAST trial. And what he did was take the literature, largely, almost all of these were observational, so it was just a case series of, of individuals. They were not RCTs. But he looked at, um, and, and his was this column before 1995, and, and showed that when studies, when they did look at couples without treatment expectant management, they were in this 1.5 to 4% per cycle. Uh, clomiphene um, and IU, uh, IUI was 8.3% per cycle. It's really not changed since that time in any study that's been done. At that time, gonadotropins, these are observational studies now, these are case series, was 17% per cycle, and it made, it made sense to do it because it seemed to be double the success of clomiphene IUI. And at that time, you imagine, it's hard to imagine back when, when the success rates for IVF were 20% per cycle. And we know what's happened. The success for IVF has continued to climb and will continue to climb uh, and is now, for women under 35, certainly 40% uh, per cycle and better for liveborns. Um, and, and with time, the multiple birth rate has come down as we've transferred fewer and fewer embryos. But we also know with gonadotropin IUI um, and clomiphene IUI, their success rates haven't changed. In fact, every single study of randomized controlled trial uh, places the gonadotropin IUI success rate closer to clomiphene, and I'll show you that. But their multiple bursts have been the adverse outcomes that have plagued them as well. And in fact, for gonadotropin IUI, it's the multiple births that got the NIH uh, to do the first study uh, of gonadotropin IUI. And this is the Reproductive Medicine Network trial for FSH IUI. It is a summary of it, but what they did was they randomized couples to one of four arms, either intracervical insemination, uncrepped sperm. So this is really their control arm. It's, it's uh, expectant management. It's kind of, I don't know if it was fair, but, um, but, but, th but that clearly was intercourse did happen because sperm got to the cervix. So that was the control arm. IUI alone uh, in another group, and there were about 250 couples in each of these groups. Um, one group was FSH intracervical, so this is like gonadotropins alone, uh, and then FSH IUI. And what they showed was it was only the combination of FSH and IUI that improved the success rate, and over four cycles, the success of, of FSH IUI was 33% of couples that became pregnant. And I'm going to get come back to that when I show you their, just at the ASRM meeting, their recent report uh, of FSH uh, IUI. So 33% of couples got pregnant over four cycles. And you can see it's much different than the rest. You can't fairly divide it by four, but if you did, the success rates of intracervical IUI alone, FSH alone, are down below 5% per cycle. <coughs> and, and so they were really low. And that's so that's the study that says if gonadotropins alone don't work, why would we think that clomiphene alone would, uh, would work? <coughs> Yet, uh, again, it, it needs to be studied further. Well, the, the, it's very interesting. Uh, about 25% of the couples, the pregnancies from FSH IUI were treatment independent pregnancies. And when you remove them, the success rate for gonadotropin IUI in that study for treatment was 9% per cycle. So that was barely any different than clomiphene IUI. It was the first study that showed that gonadotropin IUI, if you study it prospectively in a randomized trial, it's not going to be much better than 10% per cycle if it reaches that. But even though they said their conclusion was that FSH IUI was a reasonable treatment, they overlooked the fact 
that they had three sets of quadruplets and four sets of triplets when they used genetic purple. So it was this study that actually got us to, to do the FAST trial to look at what is the role of gonadotropin IUI um, in uh, unexplained infertility therapy. Now, another thing to point out here is they used, I think, a, a common U.S. treatment uh, using about 150 of gonadotropins uh, per day for, the, for their stims with this. And so for th this is what I call a, a, a normal stimulation for IUI with gonadotropins. But there is a, and so my, uh, my um, summary of this and, and conclusion was that standard controlled ovarian stimulation with IUI works, but it is little better than clomiphene at a much greater expense and with too high a risk of multiple births, particularly high order multiples. We shouldn't have a single quad and we shouldn't have a single triplet. Um, that should be our goal. Now, there, the, this, this, the, the Dutch have done a lot of randomized control trials. There's a lot of studies come out of the Netherlands. And this was a study that they did of, of combined ovarian hyperstimulation and IUI. Predominantly, 90% of these, these um, cycles were gonadotropin cycles. So you can see that when they compared COH IUI versus expected management, the pregnancies, the pregnancy positive pregnancy tests were the same, and ongoing pregnancy rates were higher in expectant management. So they said gonadotropin IUI doesn't work. Or, and they, they went on to say no COH IUI that works um, and uh, because there was no difference here. But I'd like to show you something. So this was their, their two studies, okay? This is really unbelievable. And this is taken for a lot of people that clomiphene IUI doesn't work, gonadotropin IUI, uh, doesn't improve pregnancy at all. So imagine here in the COH IUI group are 127 couples and 126 in the expectant management. Well, what happened? 14% of the COH IUI group, the cycles were canceled because they had three or more follicles. So they didn't, they didn't, they, 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 they canceled them right out. So these 14% had no chance for pregnancy and I think these were feeling like they had to do their best, okay? What else? 58% of the IUI cycles had only one mature follicle. And we've already shown that IUI alone doesn't work. So they didn't get any benefit from their gonadotropins. So now we're looking at 72% of the treated group that's really no different or maybe worse off than in fact the expectant management group. And it doesn't stop there. In the expectant management group, 20% had COH IUI. So this study is often quoted as, as saying that COH IUI doesn't work, but in fact, all they show is, which make, they make a great conclusion, mild controlled ovarian stimulation with IUI does not work. So if you're gonna do COH IUI, and you're gonna do, and, and I say the same thing with clomiphene, if you're gonna do a mild approach, it's not going to, it's not going to work. So I'd like to share with you and play, put in contact the two studies uh, that, we, uh, that we performed while I was in, uh, in Boston. And I, we had the unique opportunity because uh, I was at the Beth Israel Hospital uh, uh, and while I was there, I did all my clinical care through Boston IBF. At the time, they were the largest IBF group in the country doing 3,000 cycles a year. And we had the most generous mandate, still do in, in Massachusetts, for coverage of infertility care, such that if you, if you had a reasonable ovarian reserve uh, based on FSH value, you got six cycles of IVF per pregnancy. So we had the opportunity to do a study that in fact could never have been done anywhere in the world because no one could have afforded to pay for six cycles, up to six cycles of IVF after three cycles of clomiphene IUI and then in one group, three cycles of gonadotropin IUI. So this, uh, this we, I was very fortunate to be there. We partnered with the uh, insurance companies and, and then um, uh, they, who allowed us to, to uh, enroll their, their patients. Now you could sit here and say, well, that, then your study means nothing for us because we don't have that mandate. No, you do RCTs to get enough patients to power a study so you can come to a conclusion for those people who can't have, have all of the care so you know what the best care might be for them. So these are the two studies, the FAST trial 
What is the role of FSHIUI in a treatment paradigm for couples with unexplained infertility, the female partner under 40 years of age? And the 40 trial, what is the role of any COSIUI in a treatment paradigm for couples with unexplained infertility? And they were at the end of reproductive years. So these were the two, um, the two studies. Um, study characteristics, uh, they were all treatment naive. So in both these studies, none of the patients came having received any treatment before they came to us for infertility at that time. So they were treatment <laughs> naive. They met the definition of unexplained infertility for FAST, it was one year or 46 months. Um, and at the age, the, for the FAST trial, they were less than the 40th birthday. So uh, at the time of the 40th birthday, then they didn't qualify or older with a mean age of 33 years. The 40 trial was 38 to the 43rd birthday with the mean age of 40.3 years. And they had to have normal ovarian reserve. It's a bit generous, um, but um, the, for FSH values for the FAST patients, less than 15 MIU per mil or an estradiol less than 100. And then for the 40 trial, uh, they had to have a chromatin challenge test. And those were, were uh, uh, we, in partnering with the insurance companies, that was certainly one of their requirements, but it was fine. So let's look for a few moments at the FAST trial in the couples under the age of 40. So our hypothesis was that for couples with unexplained infertility, the female partner under the age of 40 years, an accelerated tract to IVF omitting FSHIUI would result in a shorter time to pregnancy and an estimated cost savings com compared to conventional care. Now for this, we had two treatment arms. All couples started with three cycles of clomiphene IUI. Um, and, and clomiphene IUI was 100 milligrams for five days. We didn't do any ultrasound unless they didn't have um, an LH surge by day 16. My philosophy with clomiphene IUI is the reason we use it is to keep it cheap and simple. And, and studies have shown that you might have one follicle in one cycle, but if you did the next cycle at the same dose, you, you would have two. So, I've, uh, so this is what, what I've always, we've always used. Um, 100 for five days with one IUI timed by uh, LH surge. Um, so they all got that. In the conventional arm, if not pregnant in three cycles, they moved on to the same stimulation protocol that the Reproductive Medicine Network used for their FSH IUI trial and after with one IUI. And after three cycles, if not pregnant, they went on to up to six cycles of IVF uh, and a maximum of four fresh cycles. In the fast arm, uh, we d after three cycles of clomiphene IUI, if not pregnant, they moved on to IVF. Now you might say, why did we have an arm with started with clomiphene IUI and why didn't we go immediately to IVF in the fast arm? I mean, people have asked me that forever. And I'll tell you what we did. We did a computer simulation uh, prior to planning the trial. And in the simulation, it took us six months. So we put, took from the literature every shred of data we could find on success rates, um, uh, adverse outcome rates, spontaneous abortion rates, ectopic rates, uh, time uh, that potentially away from treatment, um, the rate of uh, ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome, the chance for them to be hospitalized. Um, and then we took everything we did and every hospitalization uh, and every cost and then got costs and put them in the simulation. In, in the simulation. And we ran, I think, 20,000 couples through the simulator. And at the end of, of comparing a, an immediate IVF arm with, with the conventional arm, um, our biostatistician, who was an unbelievable, he was amazing, came to me and said, it, it was absolutely the same cost per pregnancy in both arms. I said, that can't be, that just makes no sense at all. And he said, what did it was the high rate of twins from IVF, going immediately to IVF, and the high costs of that small group of uh, twins that, are very, that do poorly and that are very costly. So I said, okay, let's do the simulation and let's do b start both arms with clomiphene IUI. And he showed that at the end of, of, of running 20,000 couples through, that there was a, um, a $10,000 per, um, per delivery savings for going through the uh, fast arm compared to the conventional arm. And I'm gonna show you, it, it's amazing how it worked out. So um, we had uh, we, we had 503 couples treatment naive that we entered it. Almost every couple, we had less than 10% dropout. And it's because um, these couples had their care pay, paid for. And it just shows you couples will go through treatment. 
Um, and so all couples who, who were enrolled uh, were uh, analyzed. Now when you look at the cycle characteristics, uh, you can see first of all that at the end of the study, um, there were 25% fewer treatment cycles in the FAST arm. So in our couples they similarly finished the study. So at the end of the study, we had 25% fewer cycles if you were in the FAST arm compared to conventional arm. Uh, the next thing that was unremarkable but, uh, it's, uh, was that at the end of the study of all couples who were enrolled into the study, 76% took home a baby. And so what I tell my couples is, you know, if you can go through infertility care, and we know it's IVF that, that's the great uh, equalizer. Once you get to IVF, if you could do all the care, uh, you, then you have a three-quarters chance or 75% of couples will, will take home a baby. Um, and, and you can see it was very similar at the end of the trial for either the FAST or the conventional arm, which makes sense. They all got the same number of cycles of IVF. Now what was really cool was that the, the success rates for clomiphene IUI were the same in the first, second, and third. For couples who went on to uh, gonadotropin IUI, it was a little bit higher, the same in the first, second, and third. For couples who went on to IVF, whether you had had six cycles of IUI or three cycles, it was the same IVF success rate in the first, the second, the third, and the fourth uh, cycle. So it, it, it's kind of <coughs> interesting. When we look at the success rates of clomiphene IUI compared to FSH IUI and IVF in these arms, look at this. As David Gusick showed in, in 1998, the chance for a live burn pregnancy was about, was just under 8% per cycle with, with clomiphene IUI. As the Reproductive Medicine Network showed, with the, uh, for gonadotropin IUI in their trial, the, the success rate was 9.8% per cycle. It is not that much better than clomiphene IUI. 2% per cycle <coughs> for what? Five, thi five times the cost. So, and an IVF here was 31% uh, take home baby rate. Again, this is, uh, this is old data, so it <coughs> would certainly be higher than that. The differences we see would certainly be better. When we looked at the time to pregnancy, the time to pregnancy uh, was, was um, 40% uh, faster uh, and statistically significant between the fast arm and the uh, conventional arm. And when we look at the differences in the charge uh, per, uh, per pregnancy, it, was, it came out exactly what our, my biostatistician said would, ha it would be when he ran the computer simulation. So it was about $10,000 uh, per delivery. The, the, the multiple births were interesting, and, and we certainly could make a, a, a story here, but what, what we saw with multiple births was that the twins were uh, in conventional treatment were 20%, uh, 20% in the fast track, um, the, the triplets in the conventional from FSH IUI, we had two sets of triplets. Um, as luck would have it, we had my only set of triplets in my career in the in the cloma from a clomiphene IUI in the fast arm, which did not help it, but um, uh, but it shows that it can certainly happen. Um, and we had a much lower rate of high of m high order multiple births. Um, than, than the Reproductive Medicine Network trial, and we did the same stimulation. And my bel belief is that it was because we started with clomiphene IUI first, potentially, and we got the most successful, uh, the most successful patients at highest risk for multiple births, perhaps pregnant from clomiphene IUI before they went on to gonadotropins, but it's hard to, uh, hard to know. So we did not have <laughs> the high rate. So our conclusions were, that uh, because of the time to pregnancy, because of the, the, the barely difference in success rates per cycle, because of the, the, the difference in cost, was that gonadotropin IUI treatment does not add value to a contemporary treatment paradigm for this group of women. Uh, an accelerated approach to IVF results uh, in an equivalent percentage of pregnancies at the end of treatment with a 40% increased rate of pregnancy between three and 11 months of treatment. That is statistically significant. 25% fewer treatment cycles and at an estimated lower cost. We ran, we put in the data from the FAST trial to our simulation at the end, and what we showed was that IVF would have to cost $18,000 for conventional treatment to have a lower cost per delivery than accelerated therapy, and perhaps we're getting there, you know. Um, but our success rates for IVF now are so much better that that, that would be very different. Now I'd like to share with you what I think is probably the nail in the coffin for gonadotropin IUI. 
And this is, a ju this is just from an abstract um, presented at the ASRM meeting several weeks ago in Honolulu uh, from the Reproductive Medicine Network trial. And so it's using just their data. But what they did was the study that needed to be done, a head-to-head -head study of clomiphene IUI versus uh, gonadotropin IUI versus letrozole IUI. Um, and, um, and they had, if I remember, about 250 or 300, uh, 300 couples in each arm. So it was, uh, they had a, certainly a good study arms. They did up to four cycles, um, for, oh, so there are 300, 301, 300 couples, um, and these were 18 to 40 years and up to four cycles. So it's very similar to the study they did with gonadotropin IUI versus intracervical versus gonadotropin intracervical and IUI. Um, their live birth rates in the gonadotropin IUI over four cycles was 33%, 9% per cycle, 32%, okay? 23% um, for clomiphene IUI and 18.7% for letrozole IUI. Multiple birth rates, they had 10 triplets, sets of triplets and 24 twins in the gonadotropin IUI, 9.4% um, twins uh, in the, and they were all twins in the clomiphene IUI and 13% twins in the uh, letrozole IUI. So their conclusion was that live births for letrozole are lower and multiple births intermediate between gonadotropin um, and clomiphene IUI. Um, and that uh, in this study, they say clomiphene IUI remains the first line treatment for unexplained infertility. In every single study that's been done now for that randomized controlled trial, the success rate for gonadotropin IUI is barely any different uh, than, um, uh, than clomiphene IUI. And except in our study, which started first with clomiphene IUI, they all had triplets, an uh, uh, unacceptable rate of tri uh, triplets. So I think this will be, uh, assuming it gets published, the, 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 the nail in the coffin for gonadotropin IUI uh, for unexplained infertility treatment. Now, um, so, uh, so here we are. Um, the f uh, for couples, um, a female partner less than 40 years, uh, I think certainly it's, it's reasonable to start with clomiphene IUI and move on to IVF. The question is, though, what's, what can we do between there? You know, as we at ASRM begin to look at access to care and, and things that couples can do and can't do because of the cost of IVF, this is you know, 8% per cycle or now 50% <laughs> per cycle for women under 35. And I think it is our job to begin to look at how, it, it, the, for all the couples who can't go further than this, what else can we do for them? And I think it's gonna be looking at things like mild stimulation protocols that are cost effective. Um, and yes, they're 25% per cycle if you look at Bart Bowser's studies in the Netherlands, but it's certainly better than 8% per cycle and, and less, less costly. So I think mild stimulation protocols. And then we'll, we'll begin, you know, will, will we ever see new treatments, uh, perhaps in vitro ma maturation in, in, the, in the future uh, will, will come into line. Um, there's the vaginal incubator at the ASRM meeting, um, the study of, of putting sperm and eggs in the small um, uh, con plastic looking <laughs> container in the vagina till day five taken out. And they had success rates, I think, in the 40% per cycle range. So I think that we're gonna be looking at, so what can we do? We know that IVF is the most successful thing we, that, that we do, and we do it as well as anybody else in the world, and we should never stop doing classic routine IVF for those couples who can afford it because it's the most successful thing uh, there is. But I think we need to look for ways um, for, for the 60% of our couples who just can't access IVF um, to have care, and that's something we're gonna look at. So I'd like to just spend a few moments and look at um, the, the, the 40 trial, and those are the couples uh, who are at the end of reproductive years. So the 40 trial hypothesis is immediate IVF is a more effective treatment strategy for reproductively older women who demonstrate a reasonable chance for success than our uh, treatments that begin with super ovulation IUI. And I think the key here is who demonstrate a reasonable chance for success. It's, it's anybody's bet with couples who have reduced ovarian reserve, what the best thing for them, we know it's a donor egg, but, but, but not certainly what everyone wants. 
But, but for those who have a reasonable ovarian reserve, you know, the question is, okay, for you, you know, what, what is the, the most reasonable chance? And we know that there is this idea, or there has been in years past, this idea, someone gets to age 40, first of all, we'll never do common IUI because, you know, we're going to pull out all the stops and give them gonadic tropin IUI. I've already shown you that for women under 40, uh, the success rates are, are really essentially the same. And as success rates get lower, they're certainly uh, going to even normalize more, what we would think. So our goal is, for this group of people, is uh, women, is immediate IVF the most uh, reasonable thing to do if they can afford it and want it? Or, or should we begin with either clomiphene IUI or gonadotropin IUI? So we had uh, a trial that we randomized 150 <coughs> couples to one of three arms. They either received two cycles of clomiphene IUI, then four si up to six cycles of IVF, two cycles of gonadotropins IUI, and if not pregnant, up to six cycles of IVF, or they received immediate IVF. And so our first analysis was uh, the head-to-head -head of those first two cycles of clomiphene IUI, gonadotropin IUI, and IVF. When we looked at them, they were very similar, um, by their characteristics. Um, well, interesting, the, the, the only significant difference was the day three FSHs. I don't think anyone would think that those are different, clinically relevant. And, and um, the no prior pregnancies, the immediate IVF arm had a higher rate that was statistically different of no prior pregnancy. So if anything, it should have made it look worse. Um, and it didn't look, wor at the end of the day, it didn't. So we randomized these couples to three arms. Uh, we did get um, fewer uh, couples randomized than we had hoped for. Um, and so our DSMB asked us to do an interim analysis and we actually had a higher pregnancy rate from IVF than we had anticipated uh, f uh, for women at or above 40 uh, in the study. So it actually changed our, our power analysis. So we had significance uh, even though we didn't receive the power. Now what was really interesting was that we had a number of couples that came in the female partner, 40 or 41 or 42, with normal, I mean, gonad not normal, but gonadotropins uh, in the range that they would qualify, who did not want to do the trial because they were fearful of having immediate IVF. Now, that was very different than the FAST trial. The younger couples, everyone wanted to be in the trial because then they didn't have to do the gonadotropin IUI, perhaps 50% <laughs> chance. But it was really interesting that these older couples there were a number of these patients that just didn't want immediate IVF. And it brings home the idea, no matter what we show, if IVF is the, the, the immediate right thing to do, there's still going to be couples who aren't going to want to do it, and we're going to do something else uh, to, for, uh, for them. Um, so the first thing is that uh, at the end of the study, so if we look at the, the cycle characteristics, um, at the end of the study in the immediate IVF arm, there were 36% fewer treatment cycles than in either the other two arms. So uh, beginning immediate, you're, you're going to end up uh, either out of the study or with a baby um, with fewer treatment cycles. Now this is the, the clinical and live-born pregnancy rates per couple. So the, the couples who got pregnant, I looked at, you know, we had this uh, trials uh, group that met in China about a year ago to come up in, and of course it, it was decided that when we do uh, randomized controlled trials in, in, in infertility that we should have liveborns. But we had a long discussion that the reason we report clinical pregnancy rates is, uh, personally I believe, and Ben Moe from the Netherlands believes, that it's a better way to look at the success of a treatment. Uh, because what happens after that probably isn't related and you could argue that. So the clinical pregnancy rates were statistically different um, uh, be between IVF and either clomiphene IUI and FSH IUI, and, and um, are, are the percent of couples who became pregnant. Um, and the live-born rates uh, were, were significant uh, for FSH IUI, but not clomiphene. It had a higher, actually, spontaneous uh, abortion rate. When we looked at the live-born pregnancy rates, when, you, when we added them together, um, because the success rates for clomiphene IUI and gonadotropin IUI are very similar, so we had more numbers. Then there was clear statistical difference between um, the percent of couples who became pregnant in the first two <coughs> cycles. 
when we look at the per cycle pregnancy rates, first of all, clinical pregnancy rates are almost the same uh, between chromaffin IUI and gonadotropin IUI in, um, in these older patients. And they are statistically different, of course, than IVF. And um, we com combine them are significant uh, as well. We had a higher abortion rate in the clomiphene IUI. It, it made this um, not statistically significant, whereas uh, the gonadotropin IUI, when we put them together, they were statistically different. I think some of the, one of the interesting things of this study was that we had a higher take-home baby rate in this older group, but they were, again, the good candidates uh, than I had imagined. Remember that for the y women under age 40, 75% of couples who enrolled in the study actually took home a baby. Um, it was almost 50% in this group, which was higher than, than I would have thought. Now, I want you to look at this. So at the end of the study, they all did similar number of cycles if they weren't pregnant and then went on to IVF. Then, of course, the pregnancy rate, 49% in clomiphene IUI, 42% FSH IUI, 47% immediate IVF uh, were, were their pregnancy rates. So again, IVF, even in the older group, is a great equalizer. But look at this doesn't matter what you started the treatment with because over 80% on, on average of all preg pregnancies were from IVF. So couples can say, I want to do clomiphene IUI, I want to start with clomiphene IUI. Uh, if you start with gonadotropin IUI, you say, fine, but at the end of the day, 80% of all pregnancies are going to be from IVF. When we looked at the number of cycles to pregnancy, they were statistically fewer. <coughs> I've already shown you it was 36% fewer, but statistically fewer um, uh, uh, from the immediate IVF. Uh, when we looked at time to pregnancy, the time to pregnancy was, was uh, faster as one would expect in the immediate IVF, even though earlier on it was not because it took longer to get in the treatment cycle. Um, but, uh, but then uh, uh, of all the pregnancies, it was faster for the immediate IVF arm. Um, the multiple births, we had uh, one set of triplets from, from IVF. It, it was a 39-year-old. We transferred three embryos in at that time. Um, and uh, the rest were twins. Um, so our conclusions were for treatment-naive couples who present with unexplained infertility at the end of reproductive years and who demonstrate a reasonable chance for success, beginning treatment with immediate IVF compared to initial treatments of COS IUI results in a significantly higher number of live-born infants and with significantly more couples pregnant during the initial cycles of treatment. Couples who begin treatment with COS IUI and then if not pregnant proceed through an appropriate number of IVF cycles will have a similar live-born pregnancy rate compared to couples whose treatment is only IVF but will go through significantly more treatment cycles and the majority of their infants will be uh, conceived through in vitro fertilization. And there is this, however, and I've, I've already told you this, a number of couples declined participation in the study to avoid immediate IVF, suggesting that COS IUI may be the initial treatment of choice for those who do not desire or cannot afford immediate uh, higher technology for a limited number of cycles, uh, given that um, COS IUI uh, combi uh, combined per cycle live birth rates are 5.1% per, per cycle, uh, cycle. So the success rate is low and certainly close to no treatment at all. And only 15.8% of all treatment related live borns were from uh, IUI treatment. And this study also supports the use of clomiphene IUI for gi them given that the pregnancy rates are very similar to FSH IUI and the higher cost and complexity of the FSH IUI treatment. I mean, um, for this group, I think it's just opposite of years ago what we thought this would be the group I would not want to use gonadotropin uh, IUI in, although they have a certainly a lower rate for high-risk multiple births. So fast track for couples, female partner over 38 years, immediate IVF, and um, this would be my treatment paradigm for the uh, present time, although for the younger women, I think we have to do, uh, we have to really look uh, at ways uh, to provide treatments so that the majority of our couples who uh, can't afford treatment today, we'll have treatments available. So I'll stop there and uh, thank you very much.